Said? Amen. This time, normally in our service, we do have an offering, and we just want to remind you to keep giving online, or you can text give, or you can mail it in, or you can drop it off by the office because we still have the office open. And I just do want to say this personally uh, to the people at Best Day to thank you for giving. We're still doing ministry. We're still trying to help people uh, and do missions. And so, again, thank you all uh, for giving. And so let's just have a time of prayer uh, for this. Dear Heavenly Father, we do love you and praise you, and we truly do thank you uh, for your people that are faithful to give. And, Lord, we just pray for the money that will come in this week, that it will go to spread the gospel and help people in need and minister to people. And so, Lord, we are so grateful that you have blessed us. Even though we're going through tragedy, Lord, you are still blessing us every day because you gave us breath to breathe today. You've given us sunshine. You've given us your blessings. And so, Lord, we ask that you would just bless the offering uh, as it comes in, and may you use it for your glory and for your name and for your fame. In Jesus' name, amen. Also at this time, usually in our services, if you're guests with us, we usually have uh, kids go out for children's uh, church, and this is one of my most favorite times of the week because I get to high-five kids or uh, uh, fist bump them. But let me say kids that are online with us right now, what I, what I want to ask you to do this week, maybe this afternoon, this week, draw a picture, favorite picture, draw a picture of Easter, the cross, Jesus, Palm Sunday. If you would, draw that for me. Put it online, tag me, tag the church, and what we want to do is make a collage, and we're going to put that up on the announcements Wednesday next Sunday, but also we're going to pick a winner, and we'll give you uh, some kind of gift card somewhere this week. So children, do that for me. I want to see your pictures. That way we can have some interaction, so I encourage you to do that. If you're guests with us, again, we want to start this series, The Cross of Christ, and we want to look at that today. For those of you that are having withdrawals from sports and those spring football, let me just start out with a sports illustration. In football, you need to understand it's very simple. There's a football. And it determines everything. First downs are measured by where the ball is placed. Touchdowns are measured where the ball crosses the plane of the goal line. Out of bounds is determined by the control of the ball and the relationship of the person's feet to the person holding the football. Fumbles are determined by who grabs the ball. Field goals are measured by the ball going through the uprights. Men fight over the ball. They rejoice over it and strive to possess the football. In other words, if there's no football, there is no football game. And everything that goes on in the stadium is pretty much a waste of time. So in football, you need to understand, as Lombardi said, this is a football. Football is the main thing. But what I want to talk to you about today is you need to understand in Christianity, the cross is the main thing. And so we started last week this series, The Cross of Christ. Today we want to talk to you about the life-changing cross. Let me just remind you what we talked about last week. If you missed it, you can go back and watch it. We talked about the message of the cross and how the wise person chooses to believe, to believe and follow the message of the cross. We talked about how the cross is the great divider. It's contrary to man's wisdom. And what are we to do? We're to proclaim and preach and teach the cross. So today we're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, just going to look at Three verses today in the life-changing cross. Chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians, verses 9 through 11. He says this, Don't you know that the unrighteous will not inherit God's kingdom? Don't be deceived. Do not be deceived. No sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, or males who have sex with males, no thieves, Greedy people, drunkards, verbally abusive people, or swindlers will inherit God's kingdom. And some of you used to be like this. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now the text deals with the question, a big question of all time. 
who qualifies for entrance in the kingdom of God? Who can enter into the kingdom of God? Now, the take-home take home truth today is this, very simple. The cross changes lives and transforms hearts. The cross changes lives and transforms hearts. So let me ask you a question. Has the cross transformed your heart? Has it changed your life? That is the question today. Today I want to give you four truths concerning the life-changing cross. Number one is this. This is a great truth. The cross and the gospel of Jesus Christ is the hope for sinners. The cross and the gospel of Jesus Christ is the hope for sinners. See, the cross is for the depressed today. The cross is for the oppressed today. It is the hope for the addicted. It is the hope for the confused. It is the hope for the down and out. In Jesus Christ, you know what? We don't have a hope. We have the living hope. We have the only hope. And see, the problem is everybody is tempted today to drink the poison of sin and do whatever they want to. But Paul demanded, commanded him, do not be deceived here. Don't buy into all the lies that the world has given you, that you can live whatever way you want to, and you can still go into heaven and be part of the kingdom of God. See, many reject Christ today, they reject the cross, and if you reject Christ and the cross, you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so Paul gives us this list of sins here. Now, it's not an exhaustive list of sins, but when it's talking about this list of sins, it's talking about these people. This is their lifestyle. Not that, hey, they <coughs> committed this sin one time. No, it's their lifestyle. Now, again, Corinth, if you study it, the city of Corinth, it was a very permissive city. City. It was a very permissive society, even worse than America today. And so let me just run through this list very quickly. He says, all right, those who are sexually immoral, who are those? Those are people having sex outside of marriage. Also, the Greek word is pornea, so it's talking about people that are addicted to pornography, playing with pornography. What's the biblical standard? One man, one woman for life. They covenant together in marriage. Then he talks about idolaters. Who are those? Anybody? An idol is anything that you put before God. Then he talks about adulterers, those who are, who are having sex outside the confines of marriage, those who are having affairs and breaking the marriage covenant. Then he says, males who have sex with males. Now, in the Greek text here, there's two words. And actually, the New American Standard, I believe, translates it well here. It says, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals. Now, the first Greek word here for effeminate is actually referring it's actually referring to males who dress like women so it's talking about the transgender people it's talking about transvestites the next word in the greek is referring to homosexuality males with males women and women you may not realize it if you read the life group lesson the first 14 out of 15 roman emperors were homosexuals and they were very ungodly men the most ungodly societies of history, study them, have been plagued by sex role perversion. Why does that happen? Satan is intent on destroying the family. What does he want to do in America? Destroy the family. Now let me say this. This is not popular, but I'm going to go ahead and say it right here. By this text, you cannot be gay and homosexual and be a Christian. You can't. Now, this text gives us the hope, and it brings out what can happen in somebody's life. And we'll bring that out in just a minute. But you cannot be homosexual and living a homosexual lifestyle and be a Christ follower. No, that's not popular, but that's what the text says. Then he goes and talks about thieves, those who steal, greedy people, covetous people, people who are only satis never satisfied with what they have, drunkards, those who are addicted to drugs and alcohol. Robbie Gowdy, pastor um, that I know well, he says therapy and recovery without Jesus is a dead end street. Without Jesus... In your recovery, you're on a dead end street. Then he talks about verbally abusive people, those who destroy people with their tongues and words. That's very popular today. We're on internet, news, and social media. Then you got swindlers. Who are those? Those are con men and women. People stealing money, uh, doing scams on our seniors. That's swindlers. 
See, they're lost. They have hardened hearts. They're callous to the will of God. They do not submit or yield to the will of God. You need to understand, ever since the garden, Satan has been enslaving human souls. And these sin patterns, if you study history, are in every generation. They're in the Bible. They're in today. And you know what Satan does? He laughs at people. He laughs at us because we fall for him. You need to understand, Satan doesn't, it doesn't matter which sins you die with and go to hell. He doesn't matter whether it's one of these lists of sins, or he might say, hey, I'm not, I'm not even living on that side of the tracks. I'm over here. I'm trying to live a good life. He said, all right, just live a good life. Be religious. Go to church. But don't allow Jesus to be king of your life. Jesus said to people like that, not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And in verse 23, Jesus says, depart me, for, for I never knew you. Adrian Rogers said it like this. He says, I believe that a great number of people are going to die and go to hell because they're counting on their religiosity in church instead of the relationship with Jesus to get them to heaven. They give lip service to repentance and faith, but they've never been born again. Paul commands them, hey, don't be led astray by the unrighteous of the world. Why? Because they reject the cross, they reject heaven. But let's get to the the phrase that I really like in this text here, verse 11. And it says, and some of you used to be like this. What he's saying, he's speaking, your ongoing lifestyle used to be like this, but you've come to the cross and Jesus Christ has changed your life. And you've received him. You say, can Jesus do that? Yes. Let me give you, let me give you a couple examples. We were in church in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, when G- me and Janice were there. That's where we got married. But we were single this time. There were three homosexual guys that got saved in our church. Radically changed by the gospel. There's a man by the name of Robert Lopez. He's a Bible professor now. He was raised by two lesbians entered the homosexual lifestyle, which if you don't really realize, is very abusive at the age of 13. Now he's saved, is married, and has kids. What changed their life? The gospel of Jesus Christ and the cross. See, God loves the sinner and hates the sin. He hates the sin in our lives, but praise God, he loves us. And he offers to us eternal life. See, you need to understand, we're all going to come face to face before God. And you'll either come face to face before God in your sins and in your righteousness, which will not get you there, or you'll stand there in the righteousness of God. And you'll be ushered into the kingdom of heaven. Say, how can that happen? Can that happen today? Yeah, it can happen today. Let me tell you why. If you'll give your life to Christ. Let me tell you very quickly how you can do that today. God created the heavens and the earth, said it was all good in Genesis 1. Created Adam and Eve, and they were doing fine until they decided, hey, I know better than God. And because of that, sin entered the world. And that's the bad news for us. Scripture says what? For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And we always fall short of the glory of God. See, that's the bad news. And because of that sin, it leads to brokenness, which you see everywhere today. And the worst news is the wages of sin is death. But the good news is this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, which means spend eternity in hell, but have eternal life with God the Father. So you've got to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that he paid for your sin debt, and defeated death, hell, and the grave. And that's why we celebrate Easter, and we celebrate the resurrection every Sunday, because he rose from the dead on the third day. You've got to believe that, but there's more than just believe that. A lot of people think, you know, I believe it here. No, there has to be repentance. It's a change of mind, which leads to a change of attitude, behavior, and life. So biblically, it's a spiritual U-turn where you say, all right, Jesus, I'm ready to follow you, and I'm saying no to self. How does it become mine? The best news is it can become yours. Why? By faith. It's not by works. You don't earn it. How does it become mine? Scripture says, call on the name of the Lord and what? You will be saved. If you'll say, God, I'm ready to follow you. I believe Jesus died for me and rose again. I'm ready to follow him. You know what? If you call on the name of Jesus, I don't care where you are in the world today. If you call on his name, he'll save you. And then Jesus says, now follow me and live for me. 
It says, be part of the kingdom of God. You need to understand the kingdom of God is here and now, right now. It's also talking about the future in heaven. What is the kingdom of God? It is the realm where God is king and he reigns supreme. See, the Lord Jesus Christ is the rule actively in our lives. And we should be l- delighted to live for him and allow him to be king of our lives. See, once you give Jesus your life and you surrender him, you come under his authority, his lordship, and he is king. See, the question is, is Jesus king of your life? And when you give your life to Jesus, man, that is the greatest news. Why? Because the cross, <laughs> don't miss this, the cross and the gospel of Jesus is the hope for all sinners. That's the hope for everybody in this whole world that's fearing and fretting due to COVID-19. That is the hope. We have the hope. It is the cross and it is Jesus. So don't forget that first truth. The cross and the gospel of Jesus Christ is the hope for all sinners. Second, the cross can completely forgive you of all your sins. Now that's the great truth. He says here in the text, but you were washed. Now, the English translation doesn't bring this out, but actually the Greek does. It has the conjunction but before the next three phrases. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified. Why? To show the contrast that you're no longer living here and now you're living here because Jesus has changed your life. Now the verbs here are in the passive voice. What does that mean? Just English. It means the subject was receiving the action of the verb produced by an outside agent. An active voice say, hey, I'm doing it. This you don't do. You can't save yourself. And these three verbs, pretty interesting, if you look in verse 11, they're grounded in the triune Godhead, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. You see it right there. He says here, first one is is verse 11. He says, but you were washed. Now, he's not talking about baptism here, folks. Okay? He's talking about why we need washing. Why do we need washing and cleansing? Because sin is dirty. Now, with COVID-19, everybody wants to be what? Clean, and there's a bunch of germaphobes out there. What do we need spiritually? A germex cleansing, which only comes from the Holy Spirit. Now, this word washing here refers to the word regeneration. Now, what does that word regeneration mean? It's defined in our Baptist faith and message. Let me just say, it's a work of God whereby believers become new creatures of Christ. It's a change of heart wrought by the Holy Spirit through conviction of sin to which the sinner responds to repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So you need to understand, repentance, a lot of churches don't want to even miss that word. Repentance and faith are initiated in this washing. No repentance, no cleansing. You have to have repentance and faith to be saved, to be cleansed and forgiven. Now, this word here, regeneration, many times people refer to it as this. It can be referred to as this, being born again, spiritually born again. See, the reason we can be cleansed is why we celebrate Easter. Jesus went to the cross. John 19, 30, he said, it is finished the greek word is tetelestai which means paid in full which means he paid for our sin debt in full i don't know about you but it is pretty nice when you pay off a debt and you get that statement and it says zero 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 i don't owe those people no more money it's been paid in full you need to understand jesus took upon himself all the sewage and the filth And the poison of our sins so that we might have eternal life. He did it all for us. And you need to understand, only transformed sinners that are cleansed by the blood of Jesus will inherit the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus, when he was speaking to Nicodemus in John 3, 3, said this, Truly, I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. John 3, 3 says, unless you're born again, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. Titus 3, 4, and 5 says this, but when the kindness of God our Savior 
and his love for mankind appeared. Did what? He saved us. Don't miss this. Not by what? Works of righteousness that we... You're not going to get there on your own. But according to his mercy... What is that? He gives me what? Huh. I don't deserve. I deserve hell. And he gives me salvation. Through what? The washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Two greatest illustrations of this radical salvation would be Luke 15, the prodigal son getting saved. Man, he'd been living just like those in verse 9 and 10, and he's radically saved when he comes back and meets the Father. Another great illustration would be the religious terrorist, Saul, who wrote this, Paul, in Acts 9. God can save anybody. He can completely forgive you of all your sins. You, you might say, Brad, you don't know what I've done. It doesn't matter. Jesus died for every one of those sins. And he is the hope, the cross, and the gospel is the hope for all sinners. Let's move on. Number three, the cross changes your behavior and lifestyle. The cross changes your behavior and lifestyle. He says, but you were sanctified. Now, that means we're set apart unto God to live for him. Now, again, sin contaminates. And we've been saved to be used by God for special purposes. See, once you give your life to Christ, you belong to Him. Now, this big word, sanctification, it's twofold. You need to understand at the moment of regeneration and you give your life to Christ, you're set apart. The Holy Spirit now dwells within you. Now your body, as uh, 1 Corinthians, as we read in 3 and 6, now your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's the home of the Holy Spirit. It's where the Holy Spirit dwells. And you're referred to no longer as a sinner, but a saint. You're set apart. But the process of sanctification is, not, is incomplete. See, the goal of sanctification is to be like Jesus. And Paul's telling, hey, hey, you need to understand, you're not to live the way you used to be in verses 9 and 10. Now you need to understand you've been sanctified. You're to live like Christ. Now you've got to understand, Jesus changes our behavior and lifestyle once there's repentance and faith. Does that mean we live a perfect life? No, but there will be a radical change. There'll be change. And there'll be change over time. Why? Because this sanctification is a process, it's progressive, and it's not too, totally finished till you get to heaven. And that's glorification. So after we come to know Christ and we're cleansed and we receive salvation, this is a process to where we allow God to work in our lives, where we grow in our walk, we're led by the Holy Spirit, and we're filled by the Holy Spirit. See, sanctification, very simply, say, that's a big word. It, it, all it means is to be more and more, like, more and more like Jesus. Now, John 3.30 says this. John the Baptist said this. He must increase and I must decrease. That's what sanctification is. Let's just make it very simple. Hey, he must increase, I must decrease. Paul said, hey, we're to be conformed in the image of Christ. Peter said it like this in the end of 2 Peter 3.18. But may you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ both now and forevermore. We're to be growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So you need to remember, the cross is what? It's the hope for all sinners. It can completely forgive you of all your sins, and it, can, it changes your behavior and lifestyle. But number four, this is a good part, the cross changes your standing before God. He says in verse 11, But you were justified in what? In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of of God. You need to understand, sin brings guilt. Now, justified is a legal term. It pictures a serious setting in a courtroom. Now, what is this? What is justification? It's an act by God, act of God, whereby he declares an unrighteous person, like he talked about here, and declares them righteous based on the imputed righteousness of Christ. See, you're made righteous by Christ and declared righteous by Christ in God's sight. Man, this is the great exchange. You know what I get to do? Man, when I came to know Christ, I got to exchange all my sins, all my baggage, 
all my junk, all my filth, and I got to give it to him and lay it at the cross, and what did I get? I got the righteousness of God. <laughs> wow. I got eternal life. I got salvation. I became part of the family of God. I'm part of the kingdom of God for all eternity. You need to understand, no court on earth can justify you for eternity. See, what God does, and what He did in my life, and hopefully your life, <laughs> is He takes a guilty person and then pardons them and says, you're not guilty. And then justification actually means when he looks at you, the word can mean just as you've never sinned. You, I'm not saying that you're perfect. It's like when Jesus looks at you now, you're covered in the blood and righteousness of Jesus. Why? Because the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to you. Jesus, he took all of our sin upon us so that we might become the righteousness of God. How does that happen? Man, He covers us with His righteousness. It's now been imputed to our account, and now we have a right standing with God. Now we're reconciled with God. As Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, since we have been declared righteous by faith, or justified by faith, it says what? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're declared righteous once we put our faith in Christ. Before that, we're declared unrighteous. You're either unrighteous or righteous. And it only happens due to the cross in Jesus Christ. See, the great thing is when you put your faith in Christ, man, you're declared righteous, you ex-fornicator. You're declared righteous, you ex-adulterer. You're declared righteous, you ex-idolater. You're declared righteous, you ex-drunkard. You're declared righteous, you ex-drug addict. You're declared righteous, you ex-homosexual. You're declared righteous, you ex-religious person. Because now, because of the cross and the gospel, you're in right standing, and now you have the righteousness, God, and no longer your righteousness, you're imputed with the righteousness of Christ. And so let me just encourage you with this truth. When you give your life to Christ, God stamps righteous over your name in His book of life. See, that's the great thing because one day you're going to come face to face before God and man, if you have given your life to Christ, He's going to say, righteous, come on in. And then he's going to say to others, I don't know you. See, the cross and the gospel, folks, can change lives. As Oswald Chambers said this, All heaven is interested in the cross of Christ. All hell is terribly afraid of it, while men are the only beings who more or less ignore its meaning. See, don't ignore the meaning of the cross. See, the, there is power in the cross. Man, it's life-changing. Those that you're concerned about, man, the cross can change their life. The cross in the gospel is the hope for all sinners. You need to, don't forget, the cross can completely forgive you of all your sins. Now, that doesn't mean, man, I gave my life to Christ, now I live whatever way you want to. no. I live for him. Why? Because, man, now I have a... He's changed my behavior. He's changed my lifestyle. Now I have a right standing with God. Why do we exist here, folks? Bethsaida. It's just four words to be passionate about life change. Why? Because we believe why? The cross of Jesus can change lives and transform hearts. That's why we ought to be passionate about it. Not so we can just have church. It's because why the gospel can change people's lives. Even though we can't gather here right now, the gospel can change somebody's life right now if they'll give their life to Christ. That's why we believe that. That's why we ought to be passionate about it. That's why we want to have gospel conversations. I'm not, I'm not able to have them the way I want to. But you never know when God might allow you to have one over line, over the phone. See, we ought to be understand. The 
cross can change people's lives. So let me ask you a question. <laughs> Has the heart, has your heart and life been changed? And transformed by the cross of Christ. Man, if it has, man, if you've not thought about those three truths that we sung, you were, are you washed? Have you been cleansed? Have you been sanctified? Have you been justified? Man, those truths, you say, man, those are big words. No, but man, when you break them down like we just saw simply, man, they ought to, wow, thank you, Jesus. I didn't understand what was going on, man. When I repented of my sins, I put my faith and trust you. But man, I am so glad I did. Man, you ought to want to praise the Lord. But let me say this. If you haven't, there's good news. You can do it right now. Today can be the day where you go from being living in your own sin, living in your own righteousness, and be transformed into God's kingdom and experience His righteousness and His love and His salvation and His eternal life. So I encourage you, if you don't know Him today, wow, call on His name. Why? Because the cross and the gospel changes lives and transforms hearts. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do come to you. And we are so grateful for the gospel that it changes lives. If you're with me online right now, or even if you're watching this later today or another time, and you know within the depths of your heart you don't have a relationship with Christ. You know that you're lost. You're unrighteous. Your name's not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You won't spend eternity in heaven. I plead with you. Right where you are, give your life to Christ. You say, Brad, I don't even know what to do. Well, pray with God. Pray to God right now. Or maybe pray this prayer with me in your heart. It's not about a perfect prayer. It's really about the genuine desire of your heart. And if you mean it, pray it. If you're by yourself, pray it out loud to God. If you're with a group, pray it silently. God will hear you. Just say, Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've messed up. I've blown it. I've been going the wrong way. But God, I really do believe that you sent your son Jesus to be born of a virgin. And he lived a perfect life. And he died on that cross for my sins. And was buried in that tomb. But he rose again on the third day and he's alive and living today. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my heart right now. Forgive me of all my sins. And be my Lord, Master, Savior, Boss, King my life and I will follow you the rest of the days of my life in Jesus name amen if you pray that prayer I invite you to let somebody know about it but let me go ahead and just pray again let me pray for every Christ followers on, on with us right now Lord, I pray that you'd be with my brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, may you take them down that road back to where you changed their law, life with the cross. But Lord, help us to grow to be more and more like you. And Lord, forgive us when we're not. But Lord, help us to have a hunger for you. And help us to be about your cross in the gospel in the days ahead. In Jesus' name, amen. Let me do say this one thing. Maybe you prayed that prayer with me and you, you invited Christ in your life. Would you just text, send a text at that number there. Just say, hey, I got saved today. Or maybe you've gotten saved, and, but you never followed the Lord in baptism. I invite you to say, hey, I, I know the Lord, but I've never followed in baptism. Maybe send us a text or you can send that to us, email. If you do have a prayer request, text it to us. Send it to us on email. We would love to contact you and pray with you. But we're here for you. We're just praying God would speak to you and minister to you in the days ahead. And he's on his throne, folks. 
He knows what's going on. Don't forget, go to the cross. It's all about the cross. It's all about the gospel. Just not about Easter time. Uh, every day, he can change people's lives. And so we just want to encourage you. Again, we're praying for you. We miss you. And uh, we just want to sing you out today with Brother Sam and the band. So you sing with us. And we're just going to praise the Lord for the cross and the gospel. Because why? It's still about changing lives. Amen. Thank you.